Okay, alternative titles for this video. Stuck in the middle with Doom. What the frack is a Blake Stone? You know, because YouTube wouldn't like it if I dropped an F-bomb right in the title. The cowards. Oh yeah, also Will Rock in Space Calamity, John Earth Galactic Spy, and The Adventures of Chad Feldspar. Blake Stone, Aliens of Gold, is a 1993 first-person shooter based on the Wolfenstein 3D engine published by Apogee, the height of gaming excitement. People don't remember it too well, but there's a super good reason they don't remember it. Let's cut right to the chase on this factoid. It came out a week before Doom. Doom killed it like Half-Life killed everything that came out around Half-Life. Murdered it. Somehow it got a sequel, but we'll talk about that a bit later. I don't want to go off about this forever. Blake Stone was also released the same day as Duke Nukem 2, if your perception of time wasn't screwed up enough. Apogee published Blake Stone, but the game was developed by Jam Productions, an outfit consisting of three gentlemen, Mike Maynard, Jim Rowe, and Jerry Jones. With Bobby Prince making music because he couldn't throw a rock in the early 90s DOS era without hitting Bobby Prince right in the midi facsimile of a Slayer riff. Reportedly inspired to craft a game about a secret agent in space! Taking their cues from obvious sources like James Bond, to the point that the main villain of Aliens of Gold and its sequel, Planet Strike, is named Goldfire. And you could take Blake Stone and put him in all kinds of adventures. Or not, you know, since the series hasn't been heard from since 1994. Normally, the story of a game would be relegated to a page inside of a manual, but to my genuine surprise, the Steam version that comes in the Apogee throwback pack alongside Rise of the Triad has a Blake Stone comic book included in the manual. Agent Stone was the first to hear the news from Celon. It was odd that such a peaceful place should suddenly become so violent. You see, Blake Stone is from old London, meaning he's a wuss who doesn't worry about getting shot at the grocery store, bitch, coward, pussy, no balls. So Blake Stone is on the phone with his mother because he's a good boy who calls his mother. Or his mother calls him when she's worried because she hasn't heard from his sister, Sarah, who informs Blake in what are likely her last breaths that Dr. Pyrus Goldfire, a strange genetic engineer, has released a deadly experiment into the colony to test its effectiveness. And then he plans to invade Earth with mutants. With his AI companion, Reba, Dick Marble goes to investigate, and here I thought he was sent by Her Majesty's Secret Space Service. Thus begins an epic quest across two games to bring Dr. Goldfire to justice. With violence. It's finally time to answer the question, what the fuck is a Blake Stone? Yes, I'm using the B-Stone source port because, well, it's not DOS. According to my mission briefing, Goldfire is aware of my arrival, so from that we can extrapolate that Jack Andesite is a terrible secret agent. We have to go deal with Goldfire on the ninth floor. Did I say deal with him on the ninth floor because he teleports in randomly to harass you? Because he's a dick. Ah, Goldfire. Fetch you a spot of golf, maybe a pangalactic goggle blaster. You shoot at him a little and he teleports away. This time and dozens of other times during your playthrough. Blake Stone has six episodes like Wolfenstein, so you expect it to have 60 levels. You'd be right, except where Wolfenstein had one secret level per episode, Blake Stone has two. So you've got 66 levels! <sighs> That's not to say that Blake Stone is a bad game, far from it. I actually think it's a better game than Wolfenstein 3D. It's packed with new features. You can even see some of them here. Floor and ceiling textures, enemy variety that goes beyond different colors of hit scanners. Hell, within a minute you'll see mutants with projectile attacks. They can't do anything to you because projectiles can't go through these force fields. Those force fields usually can be turned off by switches. This came out a week before Doom. And aside from not having an advanced engine that can do, uh, height, it has many other things. You are still running around and grabbing keys. Blake Stone has five different colored keys, but one of them is only for unlocking new floors at the elevator. That's the one you'll get towards the end of a stage, and the elevator, instead of going one way, lets you travel back and forth between any floor in the building that you've unlocked at any time. You don't need to do this. Progression is still linear, and there's no reason to go back to a floor you've already cleared, but the option is there. As a professional spy person, you'll also need to use more subtle tools to complete your mission, like contacting informants in the field. Not all the Goldfire scientists are on board with the Invade Earth with Mutants plan. A shocking number of them are still on board with the Invade Earth with Mutants plan. An NPC, a friendly character that gives you information or some ammo or some food tokens for the vending machines that can be essential for getting some health back. Yeah, all these interactive elements that wouldn't be a mainstay in FPS games for at least another five years. I mean, yeah, it still has a lot of stuff from Wolfenstein, like treasure and points, which you'll be filling up mostly by finding secrets.
and there are even more of those than you'd see in Wolfenstein 3D. You can't throw a Blake stone without hitting a secret wall in Blake stone, and when you're inside of a secret, keep up that wall humping because there's probably a secret inside of that secret. And that secret? There's also probably a secret inside that one. This secret is five secrets deep! This game is hiding more secrets than the CIA! Oh, and instead of Wolfenstein 3D where you had no map and were left to wander around like an idiot, Blake Stone has an auto map. Yeah, before Doom! It even shows you keys and locked doors, it's great and I love it. And then you're also collecting all of this treasure and these ugly ad-lib sound effects that accompany these pickups might make your ears bleed, but for those of us who grew up with our PC being more beloved than our NES, it's music to our ears. <laughs> Also, like Wolfenstein, all your weapons use the same ammo type, with the exception of the auto-charge pistol, your starting weapon, which is a silenced energy weapon that hits about as hard as a strong raindrop, or whatever. Sometimes it one-hits the basic guards, because despite improving a lot on the Wolfenstein formula, they didn't seem to do much with the hitscan code. So yeah, don't worry, there's still really shitty hitscan enemies, like my nemesis, the Star Trooper. <laughs> Who doesn't just show up in the Star Institute, he hangs around for the rest of this game and the next and is responsible for a significant number of my deaths. Imagine the SS officer from Wolfenstein, except once you shoot him he screams something in English. And then a random amount of time passes and he gets back up. And you know how the hitscan math in the Wolfenstein engine is nonsense that I don't understand? Well, it still is, even in this game. And so a hit from this guy can either be a flesh wound or a death sentence. Like this right here, mid-range hit and 50% of my health disappears. Other enemies responsible for a good chunk of my deaths, the Electrospheres. According to the informants, Electrospheres can be a nuisance. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> Let me put some context in here and do some math for you kids. Touching that enemy drains your health, and through the power of having clips in a video editor, Katie was able to help me out on this. Take it away, Katie! That's a lot of damage! Yep, that's bullshit. If you think those are your only plasma-based problems in this game, have I got news for you. Someone thought that it would be a good idea to make enemies that shoot the same kind of projectiles those fake dummy Hitlers in Wolf 3D did? Those killed you pretty quick, if you remember, so obviously you need to create a machine that spawns them indefinitely. No, you know what? I like this game, I really do, but this? Nah, this is too far. Drop a couple of these on Earth, you don't even need all the mutants. Where was I? Yeah, so most of your weapons are also hitscan attacks, and like in Wolfenstein, the biggest difference between them is the rate of fire. Your auto-charge pistol sucks, your regular pistol also sucks, then you've got your... rapid assault weapon. Yeah, it's fucking raw! You know what, I feel kind of bad about how easy that was. Can I get a jolt for that? You would like to volunteer for an electric shock. Yeah, look, sometimes I need a little kick in the ass, you know, to keep the content fresh. Boy, what kind of show do you think you do? I'm a video essayist. Not buying it, huh? Shut up, content monkey. You've also got your dual neutron disruptor, and this is where it dawned on me that Corridor 7 was trying to rip off Blake Stone the most, and that Blake Stone is Corridor 7, but good. The rapid assault weapon and the dual neutron disruptor are basically the machine gun and the chain gun from Wolfenstein, but then eventually you get the big gun. And by eventually, I mean in a secret in the first level.
a plasma discharge unit, a PDU, but a BFG by any other name. Sort of like a rapid fire grenade launcher, it's my go-to weapon for the rest of the playthrough, as in 64 more levels. I missed one of the secret levels, I don't know where that is in episode 4, so you'll see a lot of it is what I'm saying, and I have my reasons for doing this. Normally the biggest weapon in your arsenal isn't practical because it eats through ammo or has splash damage, not this time. While other weapons use one energy per shot, and the PDU uses four, the other weapons are hit scans that have random damage potential. The hit scan weapons generally, generally, work better when you're closer to the enemies. But you know what works even better? Hot fucking plasma! And they don't always hit their mark, and the projectiles seem to be kind of jankily tied to some basic approximation of gravity, like... It's not actually gravity, right? The sprite's frames are animated to move down? They're not doing this because of somebody programming another dimension onto this whole thing. It's a complete lie. And one of the frames is misaligned, and it's still your best option in terms of weaponry. Right, stay with me. I'm going somewhere with this? The PDU uses four ammo per shot, but it also produces a reliable amount of damage that will one-hit most enemies and whatever is next to them, and probably some informants. I kill a lot of informants during this whole thing, which is their fault for being stupid and hanging around where there's a madman with an explosive plasma weapon running around. It can take more than four shots from any other weapon to kill an enemy, so it's actually the most ammo-efficient option. And the devs knew this, and they did something about it later, but that's something we'll get to. The only drawback is that the PDU can't kill every enemy. It's limited to all but one, the ceiling turrets, because as we've established, it is totally 100% affected by gravity. Wink wink. The ceiling turrets can't be killed with it, and they also can't be killed with the pistol. They're heavily armored and can only be killed with higher tier plasma weapons like the raw and the dual neutron disruptor. All this adds up to an enjoyable game for the most part, with a lot of struggling and game loading based on some bullshit like two-thirds of your health disappearing from one hit because a guard got lucky. However, any moderately skilled player will have all the weapons by the end of level two of an episode, usually. And you'll also have met a majority of the enemies in the first episode of the game, meaning that things can get a little repetitive. See, before real 3D levels, things like binary space partitioning, when the levels were created in a tile editor, you could throw levels together really quickly, so it makes sense that for these old games, you really get banged for your buck. 66 levels. A lot of them are the same, which is why I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the levels themselves. There's cool stuff, don't get me wrong, and it goes a lot farther than Wolfenstein 3D did when it comes to making these places feel like, well, actual places, and not brick mazes full of Nazis. With all the interactive stuff, and the NPCs, and the little bits of environmental detail, and, oh yeah, actual level names that you can see at the top because this was before we could make the heads-up display not take up a third of the screen, the difficulty of the episode zigzags from being easy at the start, and I think the hardest it gets is around the beginning of episode 4, which gives you a plasma fucker upper at the start. Not even in a secret, which is a bad omen. <laughs> Jesus, I'm just trying to wall hump here. Give me a break. Episode 3 starts you off with your shitty pistols, and then the ceiling turrets you can't destroy with the pistol. Have fun with that shit. Yeah, we're not asking what that pink meat is. It gives us health, I don't want to know where it came from, especially since none of the enemies are that color. One drawback of the big plasma boner is that if there's a thing that can open or blow up near it, that thing will blow up. And there's a few enemies in this game that can be released from cages or tanks when that happens. Like this xenomorph. Then you got one of these high security genetic guards, right, and- FUCK! How long was that, Katie? Awesome. That was from full health, isn't that fun? Secrets in this game don't play around either, because they've usually got enemies inside them, too, meaning you have to find them if you want 100% completion. Which I don't, don't even ask. I didn't do 100% completion, and I still got 14 hours of Blake Stone footage to go through here. Here's something that blew me away. This informant. This isn't something that happened ever again in this game. The informant told me that hidden arenas can be accessed from this room, this completely nondescript hallway. And he was right, here's a secret. I wouldn't call this an arena, though. Though, maybe that's a typo. But there's another secret wall in this room that does have one enemy behind it, one of these exploding drones, so I guess maybe technically that's an arena? So this is all well and good, but gameplay is pretty much the same throughout each floor. Until...
Each episode starts with you and your wimpy silent pistol and ends with you armed to the teeth ready to fight a mutant boss on the ninth floor. But first, Goldfire pays you a visit. Ah, Goldfire, old chap. Sharp shoot you wearing. Plasma resistant, I see. Yeah, he shows up in each boss level and you have to defeat him so that he'll drop a key and teleport away so you can kill the real boss of the episode, like this guy here, the spider mutant. Or this guy, the acid dragon. Or this one, the breather beast. Or the cyborg warrior. Or the biomech guardian. Okay. Suppose I could try a different strategy. Just kidding. Or the final boss of the game, which is not Goldfire, but instead the Reptilian Warrior. You do not kill Goldfire at the end of this game, which is kind of strange, right? Nope, he still drops a key, and at the end of each episode on Floor 9, you can usually find another red key in a secret that will unlock Floor 10, the second secret level of the episode. A totally optional thing you do after the boss is dead. And sometimes the red key isn't even in a secret. And one time, there's a secret exit inside the secret level to take you from Secret Floor 2 to Secret Floor 1, and all you're really doing is grabbing treasure. So much treasure. <laughs> Secret levels are usually a little more stuffed with treasure and monsters, and maybe you play in Episode 6 and you find one of those secret teleporters that take you to the episode's first secret level. This one being Goldfire's Money Vault? <laughs> Hell yeah, try funding a mutant invasion after I take all your gold, bitch! I hope Blake doesn't have to, like, turn this money into the British government at the end of this. After each episode, you'll see the cutest attempt at a short cutscene. I love these, they actually do look super good for the time. After the final boss is dead, you have to destroy a bunch of projection generators, which were gonna be used to transport the mutants to Earth. Let me just go through here and... <laughs> Oh, I ran out of ammo. Okay, we're done. Man, Apogee back in the day had the best presentation. Absolute kings. So that was Blake Stone Aliens of Gold, a pretty enjoyable romp. It probably would have been remembered better for pushing technology forward a bit. You know, if Doom hadn't come out a week later. According to an interview with Mike Maynard, Apogee wanted the game to have a bit more work and polish, so it was delayed and, well, you see where that went. I want to add that it seems like there's no bad blood here and that Apogee treated Jam Productions well by all accounts I could find. I'd give it a solid 8 out of 10. It's good, I like it. Though you shouldn't play it all at once. I did an episode a day and I still got kind of bored towards the end because like Wolf 3D, it's a mile wide, but not quite an inch deep. Wolf 3D was an inch deep. I'd give Blake Stone about 6 inches by comparison. I can't decide if it's lazier to write a dick joke here or to not write a dick joke here. Hey. Everybody, look at the video essayist over here. Yeah. So then in 1994, they made Blakestone Planet Strike? You know, kind of like Spear of Destiny. It's shorter, like a third of the length. There's 24 levels in Planet Strike, and I can say that I played 21 of them. I miss the secret ones. It is, however, not quite like Spear of Destiny. It's not just new levels, it's new everything. Better graphics. Look at those redrawn weapon sprites. No, wait, that is definitely the hand sprite from Rise of the Triad. Better effects. The levels can now have different lighting. Wow. 
higher resolution sprites for enemies, because they used the boss enemy sprites from Aliens of Gold for common enemies. What? A new weapon, the Anti-Plasma Cannon. No full view auto map. Wait, what the fuck? Some of these changes are not for the better, like cloaked guards. Oh, sorry, informant dude, don't walk behind cloaked guards. It's not like you can't see them, all right? He's clearly there. All the enemies are basically the same, except reskinned to be more alien and renamed. Ah, yes, I too am a veteran of the tech wars. The body count keeps rising, and it's harder and harder to justify it. We're not the killers. They are. So Planet Strike is more or less the same, with updated visuals and slightly updated technology. So how can it be a worse game? Well, let's get the easy part out of the way. The level design is weaker, I think. And towards the end of the game, it feels like they're trying to get this thing out the door. Like they know the Blake Stone franchise doesn't have much of a future, which is a depressing thing. The last few levels before the final boss are tiny, almost perfunctory compared to the more sprawling and interesting ones that came before. And I would show you an overhead view of the whole map like I did in the previous game, but I can't, because you don't get one of those anymore. The whole auto-map thing has been retooled and now sucks. You might see that you have a mini-map on the HUD there. Very cool, nice to have. But it's all you have for the map, and you can't zoom out. So navigating these levels is more difficult than it was in the previous game. You can zoom in, and there's this extra bar on the side, which is radar power. Yeah, power for the radar on your map, because you can zoom in all the way, and it'll show you where secret walls are. Cool, right? Yeah. Except while there were a million secrets in the previous game, there's like a quarter as many here, so they've introduced a mechanic that'll help you find something in the first game that was rewarding, and made sure that you not only find those things less, by a frustrating amount, but in order to find those rewarding things less, you need to find new pickups to power the radar that runs dry pretty quickly. To the point that you'll still be wall humping when that runs out, and you'll still, overall, be finding a lot less. You'll also see the level simplified somewhat, and the number of keys reduced, which would impact the amount of time you spend looking for stuff, except you crippled the fucking auto map so it actually takes longer in most cases. And to exit a level, you don't have to find a red key anymore, you have to pick up a bomb and plant it at a security cube, blowing that up, and now you can head to the exit teleporter and it gives you access to the next area. That's also not a bad idea, although it adds an extra step to leaving the level, okay? So three keys plus one bomb plus going to the security cube, that's five things still, right? I don't know, maybe I was just really burned out on Blake Stone after playing over 60 levels of that last game and then going right into Planet Strike because it's different enough to talk about in a video, but not different enough to warrant its own video no matter how hungry the content vultures get. So that new weapon, the Anti-Plasma Cannon, is an explosive plasma weapon like the PDU, except they don't pretend it's affected by gravity, it eats up twice the ammo, and does even more damage. And that's cool, no complaints. But there was that issue I mentioned before where any smart player would use the more ammo-efficient non-hitscan weapons that one-hit most of the monsters. Well, the devs thought of a way to discourage that. See, the deterrent they implemented to stop you from using your most effective weapons was to make it so that the ammo pickups now explode if they're within range of it. You know, so now you waste more ammo if you're not careful. I see. Threatening to blow me up if I don't play your way. Well, guess what, Jam Productions? That doesn't deter me, because I don't negotiate with terrorists. Sorry, informants. Game needed better balance. This whole thing feels a little rushed and unceremonious, if I'm being honest. There are new bosses, like the giant stalker, a recolor of a common enemy from Aliens of Gold, so you're reusing boss sprites as common enemies and common enemy sprites as bosses. Is that what I'm seeing? There's a boss every five levels, like in Spirit Destiny, and so the second one is actually something that you guys have haven't seen before, and you'll barely see it now. See, there are bosses that aren't reused assets, like in Goldfire's Lair, where you fight the Crawler Beast, a fearsome... giant rat? Yeah, that wasn't so hard. And thankfully, this game gives us some fucking closure too, since you actually fight Goldfire. Yes, Goldfire. Long past time we- HOLY SHIT! Oh, so Goldfire has the most effective attack in either of these games, just spamming energy at you in a pattern that's hard to avoid. But I know is one weakness, the weakness of all FPS bosses in these sophomore years of game design. Circle strafing.
you might say that's not fair, Civvy, because you couldn't really circle strafe in those days in that engine. When you had one key you had to hold down as a strafe modifier. But I don't care. Goldfire is dead, and that's what matters. Great work, Blake. You've defeated Dr. Goldfire. And avenged my sister, right? I avenged my sister, right? I think that might have been a comic-only thing. No! No! Not again! Why can't you people space out your releases? I guess June is gonna be a month of new releases, God help me. Since y'all wouldn't shut the fuck up about Bolt Gun, whatever that is, I'm not a 40k nerd, so I hope you enjoy that video. Suckers.